So we talked about two distance measures and Mahronov's distance, which is the literal distance between xi and xj, and another distance which was called propensity score. So what is propensity score? So as I said, the propensity score is a conditional probability of receiving the treatment. It has a, something called the balancing property. That is, conditionals on propensity score, it turns out that treatment and X are independent of one another. Okay, so this is just a mathematical property. It doesn't require any assumption. So it's basically once you condition on the propensity score, the treatment is unrelated with X. In other words, if you have two people who have the same propensity score, then their characteristics would be independent of which one is going to receive the treatment. Okay. So this is an uh, important balance and property. So what this implies is that if we match on the propensity score, then we can make the treatment and control group similar to one another in terms of X. Right? So in a, in a sense, the propensity score is a good summary of a multivariate vector of x because once I condition on the propensity score, then the treatment is going to be independent of x, which justifies why you might want to match on the propensity score. If we assume exogeneity or unconfoundedness given the propensity, uh, given x, it turns out that the same exogeneity assumption holds given the propensity score. So uh, if the treatment is unconfounded conditional on x, it is also unconfounded uh, conditional on pi uh, propensity score. So this again also justifies why um, you might use a propensity score as a way to um, do a matching. So it's a nice dimension reduction pro uh, property. So propensity score is one number, and therefore um, it's easier, much easier to match directly than matching on um, X, uh, which is high dimension, could be high, high dimensional. Now you have to note that true, true propensity score is unknown. So propensity score matching only works if the propensity score is correct. Okay. So that's something I call propensity score tautology. If the propensity score is wrong, then the propensity score matching doesn't work. Okay. So that's why it's important to um, have a flexible model for propensity score. So often nowadays people use machine learning methods uh, for, for propensity score uh, to estimate the propensity score. And it's also important to check whether once you estimate the propensity score pi, whether the treatment and uh, vari uh, variables x is uh, indeed independent of one another. So the balancing property can be used as a diagnostic to see whether the propensity score is well estimated. Okay? So in that sense, it you provides a useful way of checking to see whether your matching strategy is working well. Now, for any type of matching and weighting methods, uh, I argue that uh, checking covariate balance is very, very important. You don't want to just uh, push some software button, uh, do matching, and assume everything worked well. You want to make sure that after matching, the treated and control group looks very similar in terms of the covariates. Uh, ideally, we want to compare the joint distribution of all covariates all at once, but that's impossible because that's a high dimensional histograms. In practice, we check lower dimensional summaries. Um, so we often use something called standardized mean difference, uh, which is written here in a gigantic uh, equation. In the numerator, you have difference in means of each covariate xj okay, between the treated group and the match control group. And then in the denominator, you have standard deviation of that variable. So that basically says how big is the difference of means uh, relative to the standard deviation of the variable. And often um, researchers want this to be small, low, maybe uh, 0.1 um, if you can, 0.2 uh, uh, at the minimum. That's often called the rule of thumb. Uh, you can also different 
look at the different summaries, um, such as variance ratio or empirical CDF uh, difference, um, difference between empirical CDF of each variable. So you're looking at the whole distribution, not just the mean of variance. Now, one thing I have to warn against uh, is the use of balance tests. So oftentimes people conduct, say, t-test or um, um, some other test, f-test, in order to show uh, the balance, um, covariate balance um, is, is well achieved. And they use the uh, failure to reject the null um, of the equality as an evidence for um, achieving a good balance. Okay? But that's not the same thing. Okay? So failure to reject the null uh, in a balance test is not the same as covariate balance. The reason is that the matching typically leads to the smaller number of observations because you're pruning observations or in the case of matching with replacement, your effective sample size is going down. So what that typically means is that your statistical power, the, the probability to reject the null, is actually going down as well. So it's not necessarily the case that if you fail to reject the null, that means the covariate balance. So it's, all, it's often better to look at the actual summary, uh, like such a standard mean difference or some uh, empirical summaries of the difference between the treating and the control group and not resort to the uh, formal hypothesis test. Let's consider bias of matching. So bias of matching arises because of remaining in balance. So even after matching, unless you have exact matching, uh, there is going to be a difference between the treated and match control group. Hence, there could be a still bias remaining. Okay, so here is the bias term that's written, that what we want to estimate, conditional on x, uh, what we're going to estimate is on the left, conditional on the particular value of x uh, for treating unit, uh, what is the average potential outcome under the control condition, and we're going to estimate that using the mean of the observed outcome among the matched uh, control units. Okay. So the uh, CARI M, as before, is the match set for the treating unit I, and then CARI X um, represents the collection of X values uh, for these match control units. So you can uh, write this uh, in a somewhat simplified notation using a mu, uh, mu not as a uh, as a symbol that represents the conditional expectation of potential outcome among the um, of zero. Um, okay, so what we want to estimate is the conditional uh, outcome, or potential outcome of y of zero uh, when the x equal i. But this is going to be different because the uh, for the control group it will be evaluated at the different value of x, xi prime. Okay, so what we want to estimate is mu zero xi, the potential conditional expectation of potential outcome evaluated at the xi. But since matching isn't perfect and it will be matched with xi prime among the match control units, that average may not be the same as before. So once we can write this bias in this way, we can try to estimate this bias. So uh, so the bias correction, so bias corrected matching estimator is to, um, is to add this bias term for the uh, estimate of, the, for the second term, for the, for the average of observed outcome for the control unit. So you can add the bias term so that the bias goes away. Okay. And if it's a linear model, what you can do is basically run the regression uh, within the matched set, uh, units and then uh, add this uh, estimate of bias term. So in this case, the, the, the mu naught is beta times x. So it's, it's gonna be a difference between xi and xi prime multiplied by the coefficient beta. Okay. So you can do this bias adjustment and then eliminate the bias. So much it might still uh, lead to bias due to remaining um, differences and that could be adjusted using the model. So this is another sort of indication that the matching can be used in conjunction with the model-based adjustment 
the role of the matching is to make the treatment group and control group sufficiently similar so that model-based adjustment can be done very locally uh, for remaining imbalance in X. How about the variance? So the variance computation turns out to be very, very complicated for matching estimator. And there's a lot of studies, um, theoretical study that's being conducted still today. But here's what, what I'm gonna present. Uh, so the one way to think about how to estimate the variance, okay? So all matching estimators can be written as a weighting estimator. This is a, why I think of the matching as, as weighting as a generalization of matching. So remember the matching estimator, all matching estimator can be written like this. The Cardi M is the match set. So the matching estimator differs how you come up with the uh, match set. But once you have a match set, you can write every matching set, uh, every matching estimator in this form. Then with some algebra, you can show that um, any matching estimator can be written as a weighting estimator. So basically, the weights are proportional to how often that control unit is being matched with an, another treated unit. Okay. So once you have this, uh, we can look at the, what's the estimation error between the matching estimator and conditional average treatment effect for the treated. So this is conditioning on the values that we observe, observed, values of x we observed for. In the, in the sample, okay. instead of estimating the distribution of x. So we're going to condition on the empirical distribution of x and then look at the difference. So with some algebra, you can write the matching difference between matching estimator and the estimate uh, in the following term. So if you look at the first term, it's going to be the difference between the mean of the mu naught for the treated group and the weighted average of mu naught for the control group, okay? So if the matching is done well, and if you have a large sample, this difference should be negligible, okay? Perhaps after bias adjustment we talked about. This difference should be negligible um, if we've done a good job matching and we have sufficiently large sample. So then the estimation error really reduces to this second line. Um, which, as you can see, it's sort of the residual term, the y of 1 minus mu 1 and y of 0 minus mu 0, although the second term is weighted because the matching is done for um, average stream effect for the treated. You know, each treated unit is matched with um, some control units. Okay? So it becomes sort of the residual um, difference uh, between the treated and control group. Okay? From this, um, if we just ignore the first set, first term, then we can sort of write down the conditional variance. Okay? So again, it's just uh, conditional on the x and t. So the reason why we do conditional on x t, that will make it a lot easier because the weights are fixed. So this is conditioning on um, matching. Okay? So ignoring the uncertainty that may um, exist in terms of how you matched. Okay? So once you uh, condition on X and T, matching is a, a deterministic function of X and T, so you can uh, take out the weights term WI and by just squaring it. Okay. So this gives um, conditional variance formula uh, for the both treated and control units. And since when T equal 1, Y of 1 is observed, and when T equals 0, Y of 0 is observed, we can combine these terms together and it, it becomes very simple uh, uh, weighted average of conditional variance, variance of y given x and t. Okay. Once we have this formula, we can estimate the variance of y given x and t uh, using another matching technique. Uh, that's how it's Inbenz and Lubin describe in their chapter 19. So I, because uh, you have to do, estimate this for each xi, for each you know, value of x. And so you, in order to estimate the variance, you need more than one observation. So you do the matching. So this is um, actually matching among the treated and matching among the control to estimate the variance. That's one possible strategy. You can also do a more easy strategy would be to just um, obtain the heteroscedasticity of Boston errors 
using the regression. So that's sort of the, um, uh, might, might, might be an easier way of estimating this. Um, and you can also do bootstrap. So in a recent paper, um, the bootstrap uh, procedure has been theoretically validated. Um, you have to sample matches, resample matches, not units. Um, that's very important to keep that dependence. And then uh, this is an analogous to cluster scenarios um, using a, a match matches as a cluster. So you could even run uh, obtain the cluster scenarios instead of robust scenarios. So robust scenarios only works um, if you um, uh, if the model is correct. But the cluster scenarios uh, in this case works. Um, they show that uh, even under misspecification and this type of bootstrap doesn't work for matching with replacement because matching with replacement sort of introduce dependence across matches as well. So, so in sum, um, the variance calculation for matching is, uh, is somewhat complicated. Um, the, the easiest strategy is to think matching as a pre-processing strategy and conditioning on that sample, the matches, uh, and um, use usual heteroskedasticity of all standards. And the only issue with this strategy is that, um, um, you know, it doesn't account for the uncertainty about matching. Uh, you could do bootstrap uh, sampling matches by sampling matches, which um, allows more flexible way of estimating the standards. Uh, or you could also do cluster standards using matches uh, viewing the matches as clusters, uh, which is uh, robust to model misspecification. Okay. And when you have matching with the replacement, the bootstrap boost doesn't work either. And, and so it's, it's much more complicated uh, how you might obtain the standards in those cases.